Well, hello there, everybody. It's high noon in Chicago, and uh, there's strange heavy metal teenage manx- angst theme music music playing, which can <laughs> can only mean one thing, and that is that it's time for yet another ball publishing webinar. I am uh, Chris Bates. Uh, editor of Grow Talks and Green Profit Magazine, and the e-newsletter Acres Online, and I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so as we tackle today's topic, you see it right there, getting to the root of the problem, root rot management for annuals and perennials. Now, I've been in the industry for more than 30 years and in publishing for more than 20, and I can tell you that the seems like the number one topic growers always want more information about is pest management whether it's insects or diseases. Uh, This time, we are going to talk specifically about diseases and um, specifically root rot diseases. Now, we've already established in previous webinars that I'm never the expert on the topic at hand, Uh, but what I am expert at is finding the experts, and I've got a wonderful one for you today. She is professor and plant pathologist, Dr. Jana Beckerman. Welcome, Jana. Hey, Chris. I'm here, so, trusty where, sidekick. <laughs> My trusty sidekick. And where are you broadcasting from today, Janet? Because one of the fun things about webinars is, provided you have an internet connection, you can do them from any place. Yes, and uh, that, that interconnect, internet connection is key. So to work this morning and found out that we had a catastrophic network failure. Uh, that's so at I Purdue. Am, that's at Purdue. So I am now currently in my lovely office upstairs, sequestered away with my puppy. Well, she's not a puppy. She's an 11-year-old dog. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, not what we were anticipating, but it's all good. That's all good. Now, I always like to ask a question when I've got a, 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 someone like you on the, on the line here. What sort of um, – you're not happy unless you're out in a landscape or a greenhouse actually finding diseases. So what sort of root rot season have we had thus far, and what kind of season do you anticipate as we head through the rest of spring and into the summer? So, you know, every year is different. Uh, this year, actually, I would say we, we've seen a, a little bit of an uptick in Philaviopsis here in, in the Midwest. Uh, uh, numerous samples came in uh, with Philaviopsis. And we've had a few, uh, I'm trying to think what else now, uh, some Rhizoctonia and a little bit of Pythium. So it's been a more diverse year than usual. In previous years, I, I would say we had big blowups of, like, Pythium or Phytophthora. But uh, this has been a pretty... Uh, evenly distributed amongst the, the major root rot pathogens. All right, we'll talk more about that. But as usual, uh, your faithful host is working the controls from high atop the ball publishing broadcast studios just west of Chicago. Uh, and I want to give out uh, a special thanks to um, our generous sponsor, BASF, who made this free webinar possible. Um, and uh, as we go along, a few of you are already uh, using it. Um, we've, if you have questions, um, use either the Q&A area or the, uh, the chat area, uh, if you would, um, uh, on the side of your screen. And uh, if it's on the topic we're talking about, we'll, uh, we'll cover it then. And if it's, if it's just sort of a random question, but an important one, we'll cover it during the Q&A period. And if we run out of time, well, uh, I'm going to provide uh, a place where you can get those answers. So, and then if something happens and you, uh, you either uh, get kicked out of the webinar or can't, uh, can't stick in with us or something like that, uh, this webinar will be archived where all of our webinars are archived, and that's at ballpublishing.com forward slash webinars. So that said, Jan, are you ready to go? I am ready to go. All right, well, take it away. So I guess we're just going to uh, get started talking about the uh, root rot management. And I, I want to stress very early on that uh, uh, my, my alter ego, as I said I was Chris's trusty sidekick, is actually the nozzle-headed Avenger. And uh, that uh, I'm oftentimes coming at things from a a level of chemical control. So I want to just predicate everything with saying that, you know, we want to do things sustainably, but I want to make sure that you get the correct fungicides to to help you when sometimes things don't go right, which is oftentimes most of the time. So with that, how about the first slide? So when I talk about sustainable disease management, um, I'm talking about making sure that you start off with the right diagnosis, which is, you know, making sure that your horse is before the cart and not the cart before the horse. Um, And you really need to make sure that that diagnosis is correct. And and I've been doing this now for for far too long, and I work very closely with Tom Creswell in our PPDL. And one of the things we're always stunned by is when we think something comes in and then we think we know what it is and we go through the the process and find out we were absolutely wrong. 
between Tom and I, we have about 50 plus years of experience doing this. And so I uh, really caution people to make sure that they, they have an accurate diagnosis. Um, and part of that is because the pathogens are always changing um, and Things are uh, changing because we keep uh, introducing new crops, which is really exciting, but things are also changing because, unfortunately, we're introducing some new pathogens as well. So next slide, please. One of the reasons it's so important to get that diagnosis correct is uh, in order to use the, the right fungicides, a lot of cultural management is the same, making sure you're not watering things, making sure things are properly spaced. But if you want to get optimal management and really reduce your losses, making sure you know what pathogen you have infecting your crop is essential. And today, a lot of the best fungicides that we have are very, very specific. Um, in the past, we had things like ban rot that worked on a broad spectrum of root rot pathogens. Uh, and over time, we've uh, had new chemistries develop, whether we're talking about Empress or talking about uh, Subdue or Contrast. And each of those, and you'll see, and I'll try to highlight in my talk, how these uh, can work very well in certain instances and even not work at all in some of the other instances. Uh, so next slide, please. One of the things to help with diagnoses um, is just to plug the set of apps that I've developed with Dr. Cliff Sadoff, who's an entomologist, and we have an annual doctor, a perennial doctor, and uh, a tree doctor, uh, in addition to a tomato doctor, and they all start off the same way that, you know, you start looking by name of the host or the pathogen or insect, and then it pops up to where you're looking at the problem, and what we tried to do was stack it in the proper order for what happens in the Midwest. I shouldn't say proper order, but most likely order. So when we're looking at root rots uh, and foliar blights, uh, we have Rhizoctonia coming up pretty early. Um, if you were to focus more on the leaves, something like impatience downy mildew in that instance would be the first one to pop up. So you're not looking, but it, it, it facilitates with diagnosis. As always, when you're not sure, uh, send something into the uh, plant and pest diagnostic lab uh, of your own state, and of course, Purdue does a great job with out-of-state stuff as well, uh, thanks to Tom Creswell and Gail Rule. Next slide, please. So, and just real quick, uh, when I tell you we're making a fortune, nothing would be further from the truth. We're just trying to keep this thing going and make sure we can get uh, all of you some of the, the best information, and hopefully maybe with time we'll get a professional plant doctor series out there. Cliff and I are trying to work on that one right now. So. Next slide, please. I want to start with fungicides because one of the things that I run into with growers most often is the fact that uh, many of them uh, are very frustrated and say that fungicides don't work. And uh, a lot of this frustration comes from uh, not really understanding how fungicides do work. And it seems sort of obvious to say that fungicides are toxic to the fungi, but uh, how they're toxic happens in different ways. And sometimes fungicides, you know, actually are toxic. They're lethal to the pathogen. But some of them, what they do is they actually stop the spore from germinating or they pre prevent the growth from spreading. Uh, some even actually will reduce the inoculum quality, and that means that there's less overwintering inoculum or, or residual or carryover. Um, my favorite parts of this are how different fungicides actually work, and some fungicides work by multiple mechanisms. These are our multi-sites, and you'll see those as an M at the frac code oftentimes in the top of the label. Uh, and I like to think of these as, uh, you know, boxing with like a one-two punch, and it's actually more like kickboxing because they'll throw in a kick there too. Uh, and that's very different than um, by doing it by a single site mechanism, which is sort of doing the same thing over and over. And for this, I always think of uh, the Three Stooges and, you know, poking uh, the eyes, and this is like where you wish you were in front of people, but every, if you know the Three Stooges, you, you know how um, they're uh, always poking each other in the eye and eventually one of them sticks their hand up and blocks the, the eye pokey punch. And so that's kind of what happens with single site mechanisms is eventually the fungus will overcome it and block the, the eye poke. So next slide, please. So I'm going to give an example, which is kind of an obscure one here, but uh, it's obviously really pretty flowering kale. And I uh, am showing what happens to, to kale when it actually has an alternaria leaf spot. And if we go to the next slide, 
uh, what you'll see are actually the conidia. And this is what I mean. This is where fungicides are so different than uh, insects. Um, when, when you have like an outbreak of an insect, um, I'm thinking in a, a landscape or maybe in a nursery where you'll have Japanese beetle, and I like those because they're big and, you know, anyone can see them. Uh, and, and you know when you spray them, they fall crashing out of the sky and you feel so good when they die on you. And with fungicides, you don't kind of get that visceral pleasure because you're not really seeing what's going on. So these are the uh, culprits to that horrible little leaf spot I just showed you on the left. These are the alternaria spores. And here they are landing on the leaf surface, uh, having been inoculated. And if we go to the next slide, you can see that um, after they've landed and adhered to the leaf surface, what you have moving up to the, the left-hand corner of the slide is actually uh, the germ tube uh, going over the leaf surface, growing, and it's starting to, to penetrate if you look at about 12 o'clock on the slide, where it's entering into the leaf surface, and that's where it's extracting nutrients and damaging the leaf itself. What a fungicide does, if we go to the next slide, is prevents this process from happening. In this case, this is a um, uh, protectant fungicide that was put on the focus of the leaf surface. And uh, what you can see in the lower part of the, the leaf surface is that the spore actually kind of imploded. And at the top, the coverage wasn't so good. It is slowly dying. But it, it's, again, not like your Japanese beetles, where you see uh, Japanese beetles uh, falling out of the sky. You, you don't get to see this at all. What you do see is the slow uh, ceasing of the disease progression. So the, the take home from those three slides is that fungicides do work, but one of the keys is actually making sure you get it on in time. Next slide, please. So getting it on in time, when we talk about this, and, and plant pathologists uh, and chemical companies have made this a lot more difficult than it needs to be. Um, and we use so many different terms, and, and I just try to keep it really simple. Um, and I look at things in, you know, one of two ways that it could be a protectant, and that means that it's covering the plant surface, and it's protecting the plant, but that means it needs to be on there before the spores actually land. And the other is systemic, and that means that it covers the plant, but it spreads systemically. Um, some people refer to this as curative, which is uh, unfortunate because many of the fungicides don't really work that way that well anymore. Um, and what that does is it inhibits the, the fungus from growing after germination. And that's very different than preventing germination from occurring. If you look at the picture there, uh, in the case of the lower uh, left-hand side, what you can see is the spore. And so for a preventative fungicide, that top little circle uh, there at about 9 o'clock, um, you want to make sure your fungicide, your protectant, is down before that germinates. And you would actually be going two or three down before your systemic actually would be inhibiting fungal growth. So making sure that you have your fungicide down early enough to prevent and protect is really important. Uh, I guess, you know, they don't, they don't have mouths, they don't have lips, and they're just transporting things uh, throughout the, the hyphae as it spreads over the leaf surface. Next slide. And this is where it gets the, the distinction between protectant and curative is uh, very important. Um, oh, Chris is sending me a message. I'm not getting any sound, so I'm thinking I'm talking to crickets here. Uh, Join on audio. You're, you're, you're fine. You're oh, fine. Oh, okay. Jenna, Nobody. All okay. participants, Jenna. <laughs> okay. I was thinking yeah. I'm missing. I, I would say here. there's there's been a, a few people. I'll explain to everybody. I, there's been a few people sending me messages saying they can't hear anything, and uh, but the vast majority of you, I think, are hearing fine. But it's because okay. they were not uh, linked in to the um, au the audio conference. And um, and so I finally just sent a message to everybody saying, you know, okay. you can read this. If you, you know, that's how you get the audio. And a few people are saying, yay, and thanks. So that's very good. But uh, you're fine. You've been, okay. you've been rocking it. So don't let me all right. go after so, it. All right. Well, and again, if somebody has a question, please, please ask. It's, it's very strange talking in a room by yourself. Um, so when we're talking about some of the difference between protectant and uh, systemic, uh, here we have a variety of different um, strobal urine fungicide, the QL1 or the FRAC code 11 fungicides. And here you could see what is uh, the equivalent of Cygnus. And here we have Compass. 
this would be heritage and this one isn't in the American market and here you could see an untreated uh, and all of these are, are leaves, uh, wheat leaves that were infected with powdery mildew. And something like a systemic fungicide or that has systemic ability like azoxystrobin, you can see that even though you've only treated one area, how it has managed to spread systemically uh, throughout the leaf. So you're getting coverage where you haven't applied the fungicide, which is so important uh, to protect in so many instances, particularly with some of the crown rots, and, and more so obviously with foliar diseases, not so much root rots. But there is a value to uh, these systemic fungicides and, and why we want to use them. And a, a more protectant fungicide um, would just actually be protecting only where the fungicide was applied. Now this group of fungicide, this isn't the greatest picture example because what's interesting about this group of fungicides is that if you flip the leaf over, the underside is protected as well and that would be the translaminar activity. Next slide. So this one I realize for those of you who have, uh, are looking at this on a cell phone, this is going to be impossible. Please feel free to email me at jana, J-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, at purdue.edu and I'm happy to send this out. What this is was an average cost. Um, obviously your, your price and mileage may vary based on how much of any product you're buying. But what I wanted to do was to show growers the, the different price per application. Uh, I had an instance with a grower who had a Pythium outbreak on uh, poinsettias and he was kind of uh, panicked about the price of one of the products and in starting to break it down I, I was able to one show him that it wasn't as expensive because he was using so much less and uh, so then I just uh, he, and he was so happy with this uh, and said that he had wished somebody had done this earlier uh, I went on a tear and, and did this with a lot of the um, more recent fungicides and obviously this needs to be updated because we have a lot of new ones coming out uh, from all of the um, companies which is really always very exciting as a plant pathologist. Next slide please. So one of the other things um, I know I very briefly talked about mobility with protect preventive uh, protectant fungicides and preventative applications and systemic fungicides and curative and translaminar is I do have a, a couple of extension bulletins out that might help you uh, and understand this and go to a much greater level. Uh, I know when I was starting out there wasn't a lot out there to help explain this to me as a grad student so I tried to write this to make sure that other people uh, understood this as well. Next slide please. All right, so now we're getting to the fun part, the best part, the pictures of the dead plants. It just makes me so happy. Um, and here we have a, a flat of pansies and uh, we're going to start with Flaviopsis. Uh, next slide please. So Flaviopsis, uh, black root rot, is um, called that because of uh, the symptoms that it forms on the root which gives a, a black appearance and I'll show you that. It is a very common root rot and it affects a wide variety of plants in the, uh, not just the, the greenhouse and the nursery industry, but also vegetable plants as well. Um, we find it, um, it's, we found it this year on a, a lot of pansy and some finca, calabrocoa, uh, petunia last year was a poinsettia and as far as viola I just did an absolutely lovely fungicide trial in my greenhouse uh, which I was so excited about um, and we regularly find it uh, quite commonly on holly in the, the nursery. Next slide please. So here are what uh, landscapers often deal with and, and these were photos that uh, I received last year from a greenhouse. Um, this was their landscaping client who had bought these plants, everything left the greenhouse looking great. Uh, and then uh, within a week to 10 days everything kind of uh, fell down like a pansy. Uh, and, and here you could see just the, the scattered dieback. And next slide please. Um, when we look more closely you can see this blackened root rot and this is a, a lovely picture from uh, Vincent Michel and what you can see what is very difficult to see actually is if this is planted, all you would see is this stunted growth, which is one of the problems with root rots. The symptoms are just so vague. Um, but you could see that the infected plant is half the size of the healthy plant to the right. And then when you uh, pull it out and actually look at the roots, you can see, you know, that, that name black root rot. Next slide, please. So if you look at that more closely, uh, this is one of those uh, pathogens that when I teach undergrads I like working with because no matter how bad their microscopy skills are, they can almost always find black root rot. Um, I, I like to joke that it's so obvious you could almost braille it out um, because this, the chlamydospores are so nice and big. Um, this is a, a photo just again showing the um, 
treated versus untreated uh, roots in a, a trial that I did uh, previously um, using a product that will be coming to market soon called Orchestra. Uh, and you can once again see that uh, at the surface, the plants, the, the foliar portion of the plant, they don't look all that different. The, different hap the difference happens when you put them out in the landscape and then they end up becoming heat stressed and uh, uh, drought stressed as well. So one of the interesting things about doing these trials is uh, I, I have these in a growth chamber right now and it's 70 degrees. They have 12 hours of really bright light. They are so happy. And I just put on the last application and moved them into the greenhouse, which was uh, close to 90 degrees this morning. Uh, this was the, the hot greenhouse and uh, I'm starting to watch them fall down like pansies, which is all Always really exciting. Next slide, please. I tell you, so, pathologists and your dead plants, you just love it. I, you, yeah, it's, it's, we're twisted. <laughs> <laughs> Margie and I always have, Marjorie Daughtry and I have so much fun going out and looking at dead things together. So, you know, when you're looking at a, a root rot, and Blaviopsis is, is pretty classic, you know, you're looking at that stunted growth, you, you get some of the chlorosis and yellowing and the dieback, and you look, you, when you pull this one out, you really can see those black rotted roots, and you could even, with a hand lens, I feel, co uh, confidently diagnose this one. Um, and then, of course, if you were to have a microscope, you could see those, those lovely large spores that you can almost braille out. Next slide, please. So one of the important things is, you know, keeping in mind this disease triangle here. And if you don't have your underlying uh, cultural practices right, it doesn't matter what fungicide you're going to throw at it, you're still going to have problems. So, you know, this is a disease that actually is going to thrive under cooler, wet conditions. And because it's cooler and wet and, you know, in a, a greenhouse, we're trying to keep these plants happy. We aren't always aware at the, the shape that they're actually in. One of the other things that thr that this pathogen thrives in is more alkaline pH conditions, which here where we are in the Midwest, our water uh, coming out of um, the city runs at a pH of 8.3. Some of the wells, uh, I've gotten pHs as high as 8.9, which is really crazy, uh, crazy high pH. Um, and these are two really important underlying factors that drive the disease. Of course, you need to have uh, a susceptible host, which many of our bedding plants are, uh, and many, a few nursery crops as well. And then, of course, that environment. Next slide, please. So here's the, the lovely black chlamydospores that I have mentioned before um, in the roots. And these are going to uh, come in. Sometimes they come in on the plant material. Sometimes they come in the media. Um, some growers will put things on the ground and can actually pick things up that way uh, in nurseries as well. That's a great way. Um, also, it can also be in the planting beds or in the propagation beds, which is a, a really challenging thing to deal with. Next slide, please. Um, so I mentioned this, this pH, and you know, keeping your soil pH low is a really great starting point to manage this disease. Um, but in order to stop the disease, you'd have to keep the pH down to about 4.8, which very few plants actually uh, do well in. Um, Pansies do pretty well when we go at about a pH of 5.5, you know, 6 and above. But once we get over 6, 6.5, that's when we start to have problems if Philaviopsis is present with Philaviopsis. Next slide. So this is an example, and I'm going to apologize because I know this is mostly a greenhouse group, but um, I, I work with uh, everything except corn, soybeans, and turf in Indiana. So I, I have a diverse clientele. And this was a nursery that I worked with, and this was one of their propagation beds with holly. And as you can see, they, they were having a lot of problems. And this was despite using a lot of fungicide. And if we can go to the next slide, please. And here is what we did where we set up an experiment. And the propagation bed to the right was actually uh, water using well water, which had very low alkalinity and a lower pH uh, as compared to the one on the left, where we had some, some wicked Bolaviopsis. Um, and that was using city water with a pH of, I think it was 8.5 at the time this photo was taken. Um, and despite using a lot of fungicides, they didn't look nearly as uh, good in anyone's opinion uh, as compared to the untreated ones that were just working off the well water to the right. So it's just changing your cultural conditions. I mean, I joke about being a nozzle head. Um, it's so critical to get the environmental conditions right, because if you don't have those right, uh, you could turn everything into a super fun site and you're not necessarily going to have uh, really good um, propagation. So those Next plants slide. on the left, you said those are actually treated and they still 
uh, had the disease because of the pH. Because of the pH of the water and the alkalinity, yes. That, that is, it, and it, you, you could not get as good control as you could using just the, the well water. It was crazy. There, that's um, something. Isn't it? So some of the things, I showed you those big, um, I just think of them as big, juicy, delicious spores, but I know most of you don't. Um, cleaning them because they're just so thick-walled and everything, you, you can't just use bleach. You need to use a detergent to get it into that really thick-walled spore. Um, and you want to soak those trays for at least 30 minutes. Um, instead of going the bleach, uh, detergent part, which is certainly a, a less expensive option uh, and corrosive, and there's, you know, there are issues with bleach. Um, there are other commercial products that a lot of people, including myself, have had very good uh, luck with and um, are just as effective and not as corrosive um, as uh, the bleach detergent route. So a Fison 20 or a Zero Tall or a Green Shield are, are all really good uh, products for eliminating uh, Thalaviopsis spores. Okay, so before I tell you like which ones are better or worse, I wanted to, to be kind of clear because this is, uh, I feel like I'm, you know, treading muddy waters here. Um, we're going to be talking about just uh, descriptive statistics. And uh, the best example I heard, and I don't remember who said it, is descriptive statistics are like online dating profiles. Technically accurate, but pretty misleading. And anyone who's done online dating uh, knows exactly what I'm talking about. So, but nobody's laughing, so maybe they don't. Warned me um, you were going to work that into the into the talk. <laughs> I, was, I wondered how that was going to. There's some football coming in too. Someplace, there's there's so. football coming in too. Yeah, so yeah, all kinds of crazy things. So descriptive statistics are, you know, when we take everything together and try and summarize, you know, by giving something an A or, or saying it's pretty good. And, and one of the things that I found in doing this is I thought if I did, you know, enough fungicide trials, I would have at least in my own head, a very clear idea about what worked and what didn't work and what to recommend. And all I could say is it's a lot easier to get a result than it is to get an answer. And, you know, what works sometimes isn't what works the next time. And there's so much variability. And so I don't want it to seem like I'm uh, being a politician on this. But one of the things you find when you do that is every – uh, fungicide trial is subject to change when you, you trial something else. And uh, I'll give some examples of that later on, but I'm sure many of you have seen that. And one of the ways I, I thought about this and trying to explain this um, is thinking about quarterback uh, passer ratings. And I just want to say for the record, when I talk to uh, my apple growers, this is a very resonant uh, Anal analogy for them to, to get behind, and I'm not sure how this is going to work with my nursery and greenhouse growers, so please let me know. Um, I just grabbed some stats uh, because we all know, like, you know, we'll say so-and-so, Tom Brady is the best quarterback, or, you know, Peyton Manning is the best quarterback, and um, one of the things about these quarterback passer ratings is every week they change, and the overall rating changes as well, and how well they perform has a lot to do with a lot of other variables. It's not 100% on the quarterback. Back. And when we think about plant pathogens, it's sort of like that as well. How a fungicide performs has a lot to do with the host plant, which, you know, is the host very susceptible or is the host fairly resistant? It has a lot to do with which pathogen it's trying to control. Is this product good for Thalaviopsis um, or is it good for uh, Rhizoctonia? It's sort of like the difference between uh, a quarterback of um, playing against a 4-3 formation versus playing against a nickel defense. And uh, how the quarterback performs isn't always that different, um, although sometimes we have a quarterback who's really good against the run or really good against the blitz. So I don't know if that's a good analogy. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, though, quarterbacks, going back to my dating analogy that – they're sort of true, but not always, is you don't want to marry a fungicide. Um, and by that, there isn't just one fungicide. You want to kind of play the field here. So, Chris, what do you think of that analogy? <laughs> I loved it. I'll check with Jen Zirko. She's the uh, the uh, former sports reporter on my staff. I think she's okay. too. I just want to make clear I did not make fun of Jay Cutler, which I went to great pains to not do. So We appreciate that. <laughs> 
So here's one of the trials that I did. So this is some of my data, um, and this was using uh, Orchestra, which is a, a fungicide that's going to be released uh, fairly soon from uh, BASF. And you could see that at four weeks, and this is, again, like the quarterback passer rating, early on in the season, you can't really tell who's actually doing a good job or not. And there's little bits of differences, but it turns out if you actually analyze the statistics, you'll see at the top of that, they all have the letter A, which means statistically speaking, they all perform about the same, even though the, the orchestra that's the BASS 703 at the eight fluid ounces seem to perform a little better. Um, but statistically speaking, that's not a meaningful difference. When you look at it nine weeks later, our quarterback passer efficiency ratings have changed. And, you know, over time what you see is that there are clear differences between what never received any treatment of fungicide versus everything else. But um, it's, it's just something to keep in mind. And what, you know, what I got from this trial is that orchestra in this trial here uh, against pansies and thalaviopsis performed uh, statistically better than thiophanate methyl or um, Clearys 3336. Next slide, please. Here are some of the fungicides that are labeled. Um, I would say in various situations, they've all performed very well. Um, I know orchestra hasn't been released yet, but that'll be another one that would be added here. And uh, you can see, I, I would have to say the only one I'm not that I have not had good success with is the polyoxin D in my Palaviopsis trials. But, you know, that was one trial in one situation, and it could have just been uh, against the wrong defense at the time. So any of these products are all uh, quite excellent for performing against uh, Palaviopsis, in my opinion, and in my experience. Next slide, please. Okay, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the quilt gardens of northern Indiana, but they keep me, they keep tens of thousands of people uh, interested in the form of tourism, and they keep me and their landscaping crews very, very busy. And uh, obviously, this is not what they wanted uh, this quilt garden to look like. And if you look, there's a little bit of purple in the lower left-hand corner there, and it's supposed to all be filled in with purple. And a few weeks before that, it actually was all filled in with purple. And that was, uh, next slide please, before it actually was affected by Rhizoctonia. And here you can see uh, Rhizoctonia, and I, this is one of my favorite Rhizoctonia pictures. Um, the, the grower uh, had actually contacted me and uh, was absolutely convinced that he had uh, downy mildew on impatience. And the description was just completely wrong, and the pictures uh, didn't make any sense either. So uh, I drove up, and this was uh, in, uh, up in the region uh, in northern Indiana, and uh, went to take a look at what this was. Next slide, please. And uh, just, you know, it was quite obvious then and there we had the, the lovely webbing and that we were looking at uh, Rhizoctonia. Uh, aerial blight and uh, crown rot. So, next slide, slide please. Rhizoctonia is a, a big problem in the perennial industry. Here's a picture of some wormwood, uh, Artemisia, and you can see uh, in the back uh, background there's a, a dead Artemisia, which was probably the first one to, to fall down. And then we have over uh, in the, the center left side uh, one in the process of dying, and uh, I suspect the neighbors will be joining it shortly. Um, and in this form, it was a Rhizoctonia root rot. Um, one of the really cool things about Rhizoctonia is it doesn't produce spores, which you think, okay, if it's not producing spores, how bad could it spread? But I showed you in that first picture, and I showed you in that landscape photo, it does a really good job. It doesn't need spores. Um, when you look at it uh, in a hand, you know, under the right conditions, uh, humid conditions, you will actually see webbing. And if you look at that webbing, you might even see that they come out at 90 degree angles, which is another one that's very easy to diagnose. Um, they do sometimes produce these fungus balls called sclerotia, and that's what allows them to overwinter. And, you know, these are thick balls of fungus um, that you can imagine in a uh, bed that you plant every year, like they are doing for many of these quilt gardens. Uh, it's a huge problem if you're a landscaper to try and uh, manage this. One last thing, because I know everybody just wants to go crazy and, uh, you know, kill the fungi, they're all bad. Um, if it wasn't for this uh, genus of fungi, uh, we actually would not have most of the orchids that are uh, around today and that they actually end up, the, the orchid uh, seedling, because those seeds are actually the size of spores, actually, um, develop because of their ability to form mycorrhizae with uh, 
the rhizoctonia, which I thought was kind of cool. Next slide. So here's the, the lovely fungus balls that kind of look um, uh, a little disturbing. Somebody described it as looking like bird poop to me. And, uh, and there you can see what the uh, mycelia look like. Next slide, please. Um, under ideal conditions, uh, it's, you know, kind of hot, but not super hot, you know, similar to what we've had here. Under the 80s, uh, humid, you get some nice aerial growth, and sometimes it can uh, really form a, a nice blight going on, not just spread through the roots. Next slide. Um, here's a poinsettia trial that we did where we just had some really awesome conditions, and we were going for root rots, but uh, we ended up having a, a little bit more humidity than we cared to uh, deal with and, and actually develop the foliar blight stage, which was very exciting. Next slide, please. Um, it'll cause a dry sunken rot often at the base, and then it'll cause the plants to collapse. Um, it, you'll see it more often at the crown of the plant, and it affects the roots closer to the soil line than other root rots, but I wouldn't, it's just a, a hint, I wouldn't make it a key diagnostic feature. Next slide. Um, and just keep in mind, anything that spreads the soil um, is going to spread that, and that includes fungus, gnats, and shore flies. Next slide. So when we're trying to manage this one, obviously not moving uh, soilless mixtures around and things like that is, is really important. Uh, we've had really good luck uh, managing this at the planting stage in uh, greenhouses and in our own trials, uh, incorporating some of the granular fungicides. PCNB is uh, an old fungicide, it's very effective. I would avoid it if you could because it, it's it's one of the older, nastier ones. It has a place, but it's sort of like shooting a, a mosquito with a howitzer. Uh, we've had really good luck with azoxystrobin, which is heritage, flutalanil, which is contrast, flutioxanil, which is medallion, um, and tarragard, which is triflumazole, and they work really well. One of the things I want to mention is uh, I keep having problems, and this year has been no difference, and this was with growers who were solely relying on biological controls. And if you don't have a lot of disease pressure, biological controls, in my opinion, work great. But I, I put the picture of the airbag there because, uh, to me, biological controls are sort of like airbag, an airbag that um, it works really great until you get in an accident, and then it doesn't work. And uh, so... Uh, most people call me when they're in an accident, and uh, oftentimes what they've done is replace the use of a fungicide with some of these biological controls, but their cultural conditions aren't quite right, and then they have a lot of problems. So uh, if you have awesome cultural conditions and you'll never need an airbag, stick with your biologicals, but if things are going to get a little bit jiggy or you're a reckless driver, you might want to consider incorporating some of these granular uh, fungicides in the mix uh, for management. And here we are, I just have them listed once again uh, for control. So uh, ProStar, Contrast, those are the same name of the fungicides. So next slide. All right, so I've just gone through the, the two. Uh, actually, can we go back real quick, Chris? One slide. Yeah, so thiophanate methyl is a really weird one in this case because sometimes it works on some fungicides and sometimes it does not. And I'd mentioned, you know, making sure your diagnosis is good. Um, for rhizoctonia, I would really focus and, and not, even though it's labeled for control, avoid using the clearies. If you can or you're having a longstanding problem, the flutalanil, the ProStar, is absolutely phenomenal in my experience on rhizoctonia. One of the big differences, though, is rhizoctonia, rhizoctonia is a basidiomycete, and so you're not going to get as good control. And technically, you shouldn't get any control. Nobody knows why it does work with thiophanate methyl. So thiophanate methyl is a great fungicide for your ascomycetes, like Palaviopsis. Um, something like flutalanil would never work on Palaviopsis, but it's really good on rhizoctonia. So this is another instance of making sure your diagnosis is correct so you could use the best fungicide and, and not wipe out a lot of other things. All right. Now we're going away from the true fungi, we talked about Boliviopsis, which is an ascomycete, and Rhizoctonia, which is a basidiomycete. And we're going to talk about the, the water molds, and we're going to talk about Pythium. And here I have my, my lovely uh, landscape again, and this is another uh, quilt garden up in northern Indiana. Next slide, please. And here you could see Celosia, which uh, I've never seen Celosia with a problem before, so I was really stunned to see the problems that we're having in this case. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and you can see close up, and all of these poor little celosia were falling down like little drunken sailors, and it was during a really hot, wet year. Uh, next slide. 
And so what we had diagnosed from these guys were pythiums. And uh, pythium, I love Bart Simpson, and you know, pythium are not true fungi. Uh, they're Stromanopola. And you know, I just, whenever I heard that the first time, I for some reason I could just hear Bart like going, Stromanopola, what? Um, and their cell wall is uh, more similar to plants. They're made up of cellulose, so they're not like fungi. They do produce sexual and asexual spores, but the spores, the asexual spores swim, which is really kind of crazy in the world of fungi. And so to control them, oftentimes, or to get the best control, you want to use specific fungicides, which again is why diagnosis is so important. Next slide. So here's the, you know, the two things you have to do if you're a plant pathologist to show a life cycle slide and show the disease triangle. And if I was like in public, I would stand in front of you making a triangle with my hand. And that's how I keep my plant pathology card. Um, but here's the life cycle slide, so they can't kick me out. And uh, what happens is you have, if we start at nine o'clock on the left-hand side, the oospore, which germinates uh, either directly or it produces the asexual spores that can swim. When it hits the leaf surface, it's going to infect. And this is something that can blow up uh, under cool wet conditions, depending on which type of pythium, if it's a pythium ultimum, or under hot wet conditions, if it's pythium afanodermatum. And you quickly end up at the bottom at six o'clock with dead plant. Next slide. So here we have the roots, just to show you these lovely little uh, thick-walled spores. And one of the things, you know, working with fungi is uh, nobody ever knows you know, everybody knows when Japanese beetles are having sex, and nobody knows when fungi are having sex. So if you look on the right-hand side, you can see the fungus, and I put the porn boxes. And the antheridium is the male part, and the oogonium is the female part. And they are actually uh, undergoing meiosis, having sex, to make their little oospores, which are in the middle, that can stick there and hang around for a very, very long time. So as you can imagine, the, the quilt garden in northern Indiana, I showed you that picture of, they have their work cut out for them there. Next slide, please. These guys are everywhere. This is an example of me sadly taking my work home with me, and this was a petunia, uh, a wave petunia with uh, pythium, which uh, I don't like taking my work home with me, but it happens sometimes. And uh, that petunia and the geranium that was next to it quickly succumbed. Um, they infect uh, through root tips, uh, and fine rootlets, and sometimes they will infect through leaves, but these are mostly pretty much soil-borne babies. So next slide, please. Do you get invited to many garden parties anymore, Janet? Yeah, I was told it was like inviting the coroner, so uh, I, yeah, maybe that's why I haven't been lately. I, I didn't realize that, but <laughs> darn. Uh, yeah, I don't, uh, greenhouses, it's like I, when I, I'm invited there, I feel like uh, Quincy or something like that. Maybe I'm dating myself. Uh, so here we have a, a greenhouse with mum production. You know, we've had so many problems in, in many years. And uh, with mums, uh, here you could see this, these were situations. They were on spaghetti. Uh, they were also in standing water at different points. And you could see in the background the, uh, that variety of mum was, was much more tolerant. The infection was pretty much very uh, similar levels of incidence and severity. But you could see uh, in about the middle of the slide how some of the uh, mums and also in the foreground were already dying. Um, when we pull the mums, this is a poinsettia, but it's the same thing. When you pull them out of the pot, you could see the, the blackened roots. Um, you know, some people would say that, you know, you can strip the, the outer cortex out and create the rat tail appearance, and that that actually is a diagnostic feature of it. But in my experience, if you've got really rotten roots, they all do that. Um, Pythium might do it a little faster than others, but that's not a good diagnostic feature. Um, the disease roots do tend to break apart, and you know that's really, for me, it's a challenge when I'm trying to do the diagnosis because I have to be really careful pulling things off to look at them. Next slide. So with the managing of pythium, generally whenever we see huge problems with this, there, there is too much fertilizer involved, the plants are being pushed too much, and there's uh, too much salt. Oftentimes we have growers who are uh, top dressing with osmocote, for lack of a better description, which really creates a high salt condition, which um, causes the roots to leak, which allows the little pythiums to swim to the root tips uh, and, and into the openings that are damaged by the salt. 
Um, Overwatering is uh, a huge issue. You know, last year in the landscape uh, and in many nurseries, uh, we had the wettest year on record. I think we got like 11 inches of rain in just June alone, and uh, it, it was a very difficult thing to, to control overwatering. But in the greenhouse, you can. Um, and of course, you want to exclude uh, very symptomatic or highly susceptible plants. Uh, in a container, trying to keep plants of similar moisture requirement is really important because the susceptible one with the lower moisture uh, or the one with the lower moisture requirements that are flooded will succumb first. Next slide. All right, so I have to update this. Between, I mean, literally yesterday in looking at this, uh, the Banrot label that we have, it is no longer uh, labeled for use in the landscape. So I want to apologize right now that Banrod is not labeled for use in the landscape anymore. Uh, everybody else is labeled for use with varying degrees. One of the really important parts about diagnosing Pythium is finding out if you have uh, which species. And uh, Methanoxum is a great fungicide for a variety of different things, but it is not effective against Pythium aphanodromatum, which is our, our hot season Pythium. We see it really commonly uh, in the greenhouse popping up in, in July and August here in Indiana in the lands, or excuse me, in the landscape. We find it about August in the poinsettia, early poinsettia production, uh, and subdue just simply does not work on it. But there's a lot of other great options. Uh, really excellent control with Segway and uh, very good control with the Dorn, not on poinsettias though, uh, with the Brack stage. Uh, and then varying degrees of control with uh, everything else. Next slide, please. Okay, we're going to wrap this up and get to the, the last one. And, and this is Phytophthora, which is another water mold or pseudofungus. And this is a lovely picture uh, from the Texas A&M Extension Service, which uh, Gigum, my alma mater, uh, I'm an Aggie, and I remember when I was down uh, in Texas when uh, the big Phytophthora and Vinca outbreak started. This was like one of the first lasting impressions. I remember going to, I believe it was Wolf's Greenhouse way back then, and they actually had a sign up saying, we do not guarantee our Vinca. And uh, I, I ended up going back to that bit of wisdom, talking with growers from County Mildew and Impatience when that came on. Uh, and that's where they did everything right. They could treat their, their vinca or their vinca was disease free. But if you put it back in the same planting bed where there was uh, Phytophthora, you would have some serious problems. What's really disturbing about this photo is obviously you could see the dead vinca in the foreground, but you could also see the dead viburnum in the background. And in I talk about diagnosis being a key, but you know, with Phytophthora remorum, which is the cause of sudden oak death, um, something that kills a viburnum quickly should really be a red flag, or something that's spreading in your landscape and killing a lot of different plants. You uh, really want to get that Phytophthora diagnosed to make sure we don't you don't end up with a bigger issue on your hands. So here, early on though, uh, it looks kind of like water stress. The, the problem is the roots are, are quite gone in this plant here, and, and actually the other roots are affected as well. Next slide, please. So here's a trial that I did with uh, one of my former postdocs, uh, Ramandeep Kaur, and we were looking at pageant to control um, Phytophthora uh, Nicotiana, which is a specific species of Phytophthora that is very common in the bedding industry, and Vinca. And I, I mention it's Phytophthora Nicotiana because we tried doing the trial earlier on, and uh, I was not very careful. And I believed I had, I, I think I had used uh, Phytophthora drexleri, and we weren't getting very good disease. And it wasn't until I switched it up where it all blew up. And so when you're controlling things, like I said, going back to my quarterback, it depends on what you're defending against. And uh, Vinca against Phytophthora drexleri is um, kind of like uh, the old Peyton Manning versus the pass rush. Uh, he was very effective against it. Vinca against Phytophthora nicotiana was kind of like Peyton Manning during the last couple of games of his career, uh, not quite so effective. So um, here you could see we had excellent luck controlling this disease. It wouldn't be luck, uh, excellent efficacy uh, controlling this disease. Uh, with pageant, uh, similar results with Empress, which is now more uh, labeled for full, uh, soil-borne problems. And we also had very good control uh, with a lower rate of heritage as well. Next slide. 
talking about different quarterbacks, different defenses. This is a great example, and I don't remember who put this together. Uh, if somebody knows, please tell me. Um, here we were looking at nursery crops with pyrus, camellia, and viburnum, which are all very susceptible to Phytophthora. But you can see here, and this is Phytophthora remorum, sudden oak death, very, very susceptible. Pyrus is very susceptible. And you could see the difference in fungicides. And you know, the, the take home is, is that not every fungicide against every disease is effective and not every host can be saved. And you could see here that pyrus um, being super susceptible, we didn't get good control with Aliette or other phosphorus acid derivatives. Um, in this case, dimethamorph, stature, uh, pageant, empress, um, were all very effective. And you can see that heritage in this instance, uh, not so much. And so that there isn't just one silver bullet, I guess is the take home I'm trying to convey. Next slide. Uh, here's another trial, uh, and I think this was done by Mary Hausbeck, where she had excellent results with uh, Subdumax, which I've had really great luck on uh, for most Phytophthora, Nicotiana, and things like that. Uh, Mycora, she had good luck in Stature, all of which did a great job controlling Phytophthora on pansies. Next slide. But here we have Phytophthora cryptogea, and this is something where um, I would not recommend a subdue max on, and that other studies have shown that subdue max, for whatever reason, is not again effective against Phytophthora cryptogea. So you might want to actually, you know, again, make sure you know what your diagnosis is, because if it is Phytophthora cryptogea, you can see Orvego had excellent control. Um, we've had other uh, good luck with, um, I believe it was Empress uh, as well. So making sure you know what your species of pathogen is and making sure you've accurately identified the pathogen is really important. Next slide. So um, ranking, rank, blah, ranking my quarterbacks, you know, for the most part, I still say Subdue Max is a great fungicide against Phytophthora. Um, had very good luck with all of these others uh, as well, Pageant Empress, uh, Mycora, and Orvego. I have had less success, quite honestly, uh, using some of these other. Mancozeb, though, is a multi-site fungicide, and it's a great rotation tool uh, to be incorporated with things uh, if we were looking more at a foliar uh, blight instead of a root rot. So next slide, please. Shanna, you yeah. mentioned uh, Orchestra earlier on. Does yeah. that fit in here anywhere? So Orchestra is a, a new fungicide coming out from BASF, and uh, I have not tested that one against Phytophthora yet. So it does have the Paraclostrobin, which uh, would uh, make it, I would guess, fairly effective against, but I have not done the test, and I, off the top of my head, I can't think of any data with that. All right, we'll stay tuned. I know that Good one's question. launching at uh, Cultivate, and we'll be um, they'll be marketing it this fall, is what yeah. I heard. So. I, I've used it with Salaviopsis and powdery mildew, and it's been fantastic on those. So I'm sure it's 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 looking good. So last but not least, um, we have a, a Twitter feed, Purdue Plant Docs, that Cliff Sadoff and I do together. He's an entomologist, but we like him anyway. Um, and we have a, a Facebook page if you are interested. We try to, we don't try to inundate you, but every couple of days we try to put something new up there in the world of plant pathology and entomology that has to deal with ornamentals. Uh, so if you have any interest in that, and as I'd mentioned before, my email, jenna at purdue.edu, if you have any questions or you want that price list. Uh, I am happy to answer them. So with that, Q&A. Well, that is absolutely awesome. Great information, Jana. And I think, you, uh, I think you've got everybody pretty much stunned. Uh, <laughs> but we do have one question here. No, in, 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 in a good way. I absolutely mean in a good way with the I mean, tremendous information. You didn't leave many questions to ask. Andrew happens to have one, though, and that is uh, okay. uh, Segway soil, uh, surface spray, or drench. Segue as a soil surface spray or drench for pythium. What, what for pythium. So, so what we would do <laughs> is we'll, we'll go with option D, which is sprench. So for pythium, and and this would be my work was with poinsettias, and we had really good luck using poinsettias uh, with a sprench. But the the big thing with pythium is making sure um, it gets into the soil. So if you aren't going to sprench. Jenna, you're still there? I was yep. going to say, I, okay. I am. I, I was like, you can No, we just lost you there. Just nobody. The nobody. Oh, okay. There. What, say? Drench. You just drench. If you're not going to sprench, drench. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Well, if you've got 
more questions. Actually, I guess you have two different. Oh, we have another question. We'll get to this one. We have a few minutes left. Uh, does the pH in the water change the effectiveness of the fungicide uh, used? That depends on the fungicide. Uh, one of the reasons I'm so uh, cognizant of the issues with pH is I work with apple growers, and one of the fungicides they use is very pH sensitive. That would be Captan. I don't know many greenhouse and nursery growers using Captan anymore uh, because they have so many better options. Most modern fungicides have been, uh, adjuvants have been included to buffer them, but it's never a bad idea to test the pH afterwards and make sure that you're, uh, you know, not really high. By really high, I would say over eight or, you know, really low. That would be below five and a half, six. Make sure that it's in a reasonable range. All right. That's a great that, question. Let's see. Here's another question. See, now the questions are coming in. Um, you mentioned low pH being optimum for Pythium on mums. What is the range you'd like to see? Oh, gosh. To avoid that. That's a really good question, and off the top of my head, I don't know. I would say go look at the ball guide. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a horticulturist. I'm sorry. Um, All right. How about, okay, here's another question. This one's from Costa Rica. Um, um Have you seen a lot of problems? Uh, with um, uh, diseases using cocoa fiber, any particular fungus? Got any information okay. on cocoa we, fiber we, as, a, as a growing medium? We did a few years ago, and what we had, this was a few years ago though, I, I haven't seen it recently, and a few years ago what we had, we were seeing problems with Pythium, and it also had to do with cocoa fiber that for whatever reason had a very high salinity. Um, so there was a lot of salts associated with that cocoa fiber, and we thought that was why there was um, problems with Pythium. So it was like an indirect relationship. The high salts call, caused high problems with Pythium. It wasn't a direct problem with the Pythium. Ah, okay. But yeah, this was a few then, years ago. And, and back in the know. early days of cocoa, they had a lot of salt issues, and I think the uh, more modern products are much better about uh, it is, but this was four or five it. years ago. We had a couple growers who had some problems. I do remember this would have been uh, late, I would say somewhere 20, 2008 or nine, maybe. Oh, so not that long ago then. No. I'm, I'm thinking 15 or 20 years. Uh, here's another question. Uh, information about how long a fungicide uh, works as a preventative in potted plants or hanging baskets. So it's going to work the, the same in potted plants or hanging baskets. It depends if you're looking um, at, you know, a fungicide that's been applied to the roots or been applied to the foliage, and a lot of that has to do with how fast the plant is growing. If you're applying a preventative, you need to make sure that the growth is covered. So if the plant is actively growing, anything that has grown since you last sprayed is not going to be prote protected. Um, so oftentimes, so if things are really growing quickly, you're going to want to spray every week to keep that new growth protected. If things are raining heavily or you are overhead watering hev heavily, for every about inch of water, you are going to lose 50% of your fungicide. Um, and that's either going to leach out through the pot or it's going to wash off the foliage. And while we get this nice translaminar activity, uh, we don't get a true systemic action out of fungicides. Uh, there's a few fungicides where you'll get the true systemic. This would be the, the DMI group of fungicides, which I, I in this set of talks, because we weren't talking about foliar diseases, we, we don't use a lot of those fungicides because they aren't going to go down to the roots. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yes. All right. Um, we've got a couple of other questions, but they're so big and broad about fungicide programs, like general okay. preventative methods okay. in a perennial crop. I'm not sure if that's something you can really tackle at this point right now. You can see the questions, Jenna, there? No. Where do I see the questions? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, in the chat area. The chat area. Okay. Are they, are, are, are they uh, maybe they're not invisible to you, but here's one. General preventative methods in a varied perennial crop. General preventative methods, and uh, all right. So, so one would be spacing is, is big. Not trying to pack as many plants as possible is an important preventative. Uh, trying to keep, you know, even though I'm talking about root rots and things like that, but general preventatives is, you know, watering the roots and trying to keep the water on the foliage to a minimum. 
uh, is also an important general preventative. Uh, in dealing with a variety of different perennials, making sure that the soilless media that you're using is, you know, of an appropriate coarseness to the roots. Different perennials have different root systems. Some are fibrous and thin, and some of them have a deep tap root, and uh, they perform differently with different media types. And, and the, the best growers have worked those things out, I've noticed. I don't know what their actual secrets are, but I, uh, they seem to match the roots with different media types would be uh, one of the things. You know, making sure that the water you use, it's such a simple thing, but trying to keep it consistent and uh, keeping the, the salts level to uh, a reasonable, you know, here where we are, we have such, our water is so hard, um, that's such an important part. And then, you know, trying to keep the pH down is also such an important part. I think more than anything, trying to, to keep good water in your greenhouse uh, is kind of underrated and underappreciated. So those would be the Yeah, the one slide problem. you had earlier, that certainly, that just was a great illustration. I, I just so. love that slide. I'm so glad I did that experiment. I got my money for it. <laughs> We're going to ask one more question, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, uh, any comments on how to make beneficial organisms a more effective part of a disease control program? You kind of alluded to uh, biocontrols earlier. I, you know, I, if, I, if I could figure that out, I could retire. Uh, uh, I, I don't. I don't know. I wish I had an easy answer. I don't have one. Uh, I think that people have come up with the easy answer of just saying add beneficial organisms. And in, in my experience, there is a simple, straightforward, easy answer, and it's usually wrong. And uh, so I, I would say that the instead of trying to incorporate beneficial organisms, try and keep the cultural conditions as good as possible so you don't, I mean, I, I love fungicides and I love the chemistry and I, I obviously dork out on those things, but um, trying not to use them is probably the, the most important thing to keeping your beneficial organisms because once you, you, you're, you it's, it is a web and once you impact one aspect of the web, you're going to have collateral damage and even the best fungicides and the most specific fungicides will have collateral damage. So using them judicious, judiciously is the key. Yeah, I think it sums up that that uh, that having really good cultural control, uh, really good control over the environment, uh, is is the most critical thing. And don't depend and, on the fungicides to uh, to bail you out for being a sloppy grower. Right, but at the same time, don't depend on the biologicals to keep you from that. Because I mean, I've had some very good growers who who made that mistake, and I've watched them lose their crops. One, uh, more of a nursery situation, but one was a greenhouse situation where you know it suddenly became incredibly, incredibly wet, and uh, they didn't want to use fungicides, but uh, they they did, and it did save their crop. Um, so I, I think you know balance. It's all about balance. All right, all about balance. Well. I uh, hope you enjoyed today's webinar. So much great information, uh, and I'm sure you missed some of it or you want to go back and review it. And you can do that, not yet, but probably within an hour. <laughs> it takes us a little while to get it archived, but we will at ballpublishing.com forward slash webinars, which co conveniently and coincidentally is the same place you registered for this webinar. Um, you can see uh, all of our archived webinars there. And, um, and while you're at it, um, while you're there, sign up for some of our next webinars. We've got a two-part series on, on spring trials. Uh, fellow bobblehead Ellen Wells and I will recap the, the spring trials on June 15th and June 22nd. Then we have another one sponsored by BASF uh, with Dr. J.C. Chong, and it's going to be about mites in the nursery. So if you want to learn how to control those uh, pesky mites, that one's going to be on June 21st. So you can sign up for that one as well. Um, and again, thanks to our sponsor, BASF, who makes these free webinars free. <laughs> and uh, so um, with that, for, um, for Jana and, uh, and her geekiness over diseases, <laughs> <laughs> and for all, and for Purdue, and let's hope they get their internet uh, back up and running down there, those boiler makers. Uh, this is Chris Beatty's. Um, I'm, I want to thank all my folks at Ball Publishing, and I'm going to say so long, everybody. Thank you so much.